In this video, we're going to summarize some of the aspects of Hamilton's principle that we've been discussing throughout this chapter. In addition, we're going to take a look at how it relates to Newton's second law in a little bit more detail than we have thus far. So as we've seen throughout this chapter, we have Hamilton's principle really at the center of all of our discussion of these physical applications and examples. We've discussed and illustrated some discrete systems as well as continuous systems. So I want to give you an idea of the scope of the applications that we can apply Hamilton's principle to. So we'll do that here in this table. So on the discrete system side, we have statics of non-deformable bodies, and on the continuous side, statics of deformable bodies. So if they're rigid particles or beams or other structural elements, then they are not moving, they're static, and they are non-deformable. If they are not moving, but they are deformable, so you can stretch them and bend them and so on, then they are deformable bodies, continuous bodies. And then we can also have those move. So we have dynamics of non-deformable bodies, again on the discrete side, and on the continuous side we could have dynamics of deformable bodies, so that would be vibrations. Optics, which is governed by Fermat's principle, is looking at light as if it's a particle, and electromagnetic fields is looking at electrical and magnetic fields from a continuum or a continuous system's point of view. In modern physics, relativistic mechanics applies to very large, very small, very fast objects, and those are considered discrete systems. But then in quantum mechanics, we consider the system to be continuous. Bernoulli's equation in fluid mechanics looks at fluids as if they are individual particles, whereas the Navier-Stokes equations of fluid mechanics look at fluids as if they were a continuum of fluid particles in a continuous system sense. So in the book, this is in chapter 5, this is chapters 5 and 6, 7, 8, and 9. So that's the rest of part 2 of the book, and I'd strongly encourage you to take a look at those sections and chapters which cover topics that are of interest to you. So you can see how the physics of these topics that you care about and know and love, how they relate back to Hamilton's variational principle. I also want to emphasize that our derivation of Hamilton's principle started with the first law of thermodynamics. So insofar as Hamilton's principle follows from the first law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy, all of these topics here can then trace their governing equations and their physics back to conservation of energy, which illustrates how fundamental and powerful and expansive the first law of thermodynamics conservation of energy is. So what I want to do in the next few slides is to compare and contrast Hamilton's variational principle with Newton's second law, F equals ma. Newton's second law, of course, is more familiar to us. It came first historically, and we've shown earlier that it is the Euler equation for Hamilton's variational principle. So there is some sense in which the two are mathematically equivalent, but how you actually apply them is very, very different. So I want to emphasize some of those differences here and show some of the advantages and disadvantages of each so we have a better idea of how they're related. Now let's think back to the first law of thermodynamics, so conservation of energy. So it's a very fundamental principle of physics that's applied in many, many different fields of study in science and engineering, but it turns out it's actually insufficient to directly determine the unique solution trajectory of any given system. So if I were to take an object, for example, and raise it up to a certain height, it has potential energy. If I drop it, I can determine the kinetic energy when it hits the floor based on the conversion of potential energy into kinetic energy. So I can use conservation of energy to determine the potential energy's conversion to kinetic energy, for example. However, by itself, conservation of energy does not tell me the direction of a process. It doesn't actually determine that a, a ball will fall to the ground. It only tells me that if a ball does fall, what is its velocity, therefore kinetic energy, when it hits the ground. Now the total energy of a system, it could have mechanical energy, thermal energy, internal energy, all kinds of different forms of energy. For a system that conserves mechanical energy, that would apply to autonomous and adiabatic, so no heat transfer in or, in or out, no work crossing the system boundary and so forth. So this is a special case of conservation of energy in the form of the general first law of thermodynamics. That too is insufficient to directly determine the unique solution trajectory. Again, think of the conversion of potential energy to kinetic energy. Seems very simple. I get the right answer, but I'm assuming that it falls, which I know to be the case because we've dropped a lot of balls in our time. What does he mean by that? 
That could be a very profound statement. So let's look then at Newton's second law, as well as Hamilton's principle. So Newton's second law applies to autonomous and non-autonomous, conservative as well as non-conservative forces. So basically anything that doesn't include relativistic effects. And it is, Newton's second law is sufficient to directly determine the unique solution trajectory. So F equals MA will give me the solution. It will tell me what happens to a particular system given a set of initial conditions. Hamilton's principle likewise also applies to autonomous and non-autonomous systems as well as conservative and non-conservative forces and it also is sufficient to directly determine the unique solution trajectory. So whereas conservation of energy by itself is a powerful physical statement, it doesn't actually help us solve many of the problems that we're interested in. Whereas Newton's second law and Hamilton's principle do. So let's think about this connection between Newton's second law and Hamilton's principle a little bit further. So as I said a moment ago, Newton's second law is both more familiar as well as the fact that it came first historically. It's also the one we typically learn first because it's a simple equation, F equals MA. It's just a second order ordinary differential equation where A is the second derivative of position with respect to time. Hamilton's principle is a little bit more complicated, so we usually leave it till later on to, to learn. However, they are very closely connected as we've seen in the sense that Newton's second law is the Euler equation for Hamilton's variational principle. But again, let's discuss this in a little bit more detail. So in the case of classical mechanics, so non-relativistic Newtonian mechanics, so the mechanics that we're most familiar with that governs most of the things that we do on an everyday basis, in that context, these are equivalent. Newton's second law and Hamilton's principle are essentially equivalent. Just one's a differential statement, one is a variational statement of the same physical principles. So whereas Newton's second law is limited in the sense that it does not apply when relativistic effects are important, Hamilton's principle does allow for relativistic as well as quantum mechanical effects. So when you think about how these two are related, I think the best way to think about it is that Newton's second law is really a consequence of Hamilton's principle in the case of classical mechanics. Now in addition to being more general, Hamilton's principle also has some additional advantages, some of which we've said explicitly or hinted at. And I want to summarize those in this table. So on the left is Newton's second law, and on the right is Hamilton's principle. And then we have parallel statements on the left and the right for each to help us to see how these two different mathematical expressions of the physical phenomenon are the same as well as different. So Newton's second law deals with forces and moments. Forces and moments are vectors, so this is essentially vector mechanics. In Hamilton's principle, we're dealing with energies and work. Now in a classical mechanics context, both of these encapsulate the same physics, but they're being expressed in very different forms. So the energy and the work, those are scalars, not vectors, and we typically call this analytical dynamics. So you may see books on analytical dynamics. They're usually more advanced than the dynamics books that you're used to as an undergraduate, and they typically come at the dynamics of discrete systems from a variational Hamilton's principle point of view. Now Newton's second law is dependent on the coordinate system, so your choice of coordinate system is a primary consideration. You have to decide that beforehand because that determines the form of Newton's second law that you're going to use, and it determines the coordinate system with respect to which you're going to write your vectors. In terms of Hamilton's principle, it's independent, as we've argued in the past, of the coordinate system, and that's one of its greatest advantages. I don't have to go find a different form for Hamilton's principle given a particular coordinate system. And in addition, the choice of coordinate system becomes a secondary consideration rather than a primary one. Newton's second law, we consider each object within the system separately using free body diagrams. So if it's just one or two pieces that comprise your system, that's not too bad. But if you have 10 or 20 or 50, that's a lot of free body diagrams you have to analyze. Hamilton's principle, on the other hand, considers the system as a whole. It's a definite integral that covers the entire spatial as well as temporal domain of the particular problem. So remember, we talk about it as a global law as opposed to a differential equation, such as F equals MA, which is a local law that applies at every individual point within the domain. Constraints must be incorporated explicitly, and by that I mean 
the free body diagrams are going to take into account and we'll need to get the forces, the expressions for the forces that replace those constraints when you cut them away to form your free body diagram. For Hamilton's principle, on the other hand, the virtual displacements take into account those geometric constraints on the movement of the system, and it does so implicitly, so it's not something we have to explicitly consider. It's done so implicitly by the virtual displacements. Newton's second law, there is no distinction between conservative and non-conservative forces. This is one reason why that distinction is confusing when we get to it, because if we live in a Newton's second law world, we don't actually have to worry about this distinction. When we get to Hamilton's principle, then we do. In that case, conservative and non-conservative forces are treated differently. So that's actually one advantage of Newton's second law, is that we don't need to make that distinction. We apply them in exactly the same way. Newton's second law applies primarily to discrete systems. Now it does apply to continuous systems, and so most of us have seen examples where F equals MA has been applied to infinitesimally small pieces of a continuous substance. But primarily we think of F equals MA as applying to discrete systems, whereas in the case of Hamilton's principle, it's very natural to apply it both to discrete and continuous systems. It's very similar in both. The process is very similar to get your T's and your V's, your kinetic and potential energy expressions sum them up through integration and, and so forth. Newton's second law, as we said a moment ago, applies in the case of classical mechanics, whereas Hamilton's principle intuitively unifies classical mechanics as well as modern physics, such as relativistic effects, within a mathematically compact and, and very powerful way. One final point about Hamilton's principle, there is an explicit connection between the mathematical symmetries and the conservation laws. So this is a reference to Noether's theorem from a previous video. Noether's theorem allows us to look at just the Lagrangian of a system and determine symmetries, physical symmetries, and conservation laws that apply to that particular system. We don't have to solve anything. We don't even have to get the equations of motion. We can learn those things about the physical system that we're considering directly from looking at the Lagrangian. It's very, very powerful.